All right, so let's get started with some basic GDB usage. Uh, first, I'm going to run through the program over on the right hand side here. That is our example program that we're going to be debugging. Uh, if we look here, we'll start at main. Uh, it's first thing it's going to do is it's going to check the argument count. Uh, if the argument count is less than two, uh, which means that we did not supply an argument, then it is going to print out a message and then exit with an exit code of one. Uh, assuming that there is at least one argument to the program, it's going to call my hello function uh, with argv and argc. Jumping down here to the implementation of my hello function, what it is going to do is it's going to loop through the arguments and print the hello followed by the name that was passed to it as an argument. So let's compile this. and make sure it behaves as we would expect. So with no arguments, it does say argc is less than two. With one argument, it does say hello followed by the name. And with multiple arguments, it does in fact provide a greeting to all three of them. So let's use GDB and take a look at this program. Now using GDB, you just type GDB followed by the program that you want to debug. So GDB has now loaded this program a.out. However, a.out has not started. In order to run the program, uh, we use the run command. And we see that we did not provide any arguments uh, to a.out. So it says argc is less than two. To provide an argument, we just supply uh, additional arguments after the run command. Uh, so we can do something similar here. And we see, hello, Robert, hello, Jan, hello, Michael, uh, and then it exited. Now, that's great, but we do want to debug and kind of get some information uh, about this, this program. And so the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to set a breakpoint. Now, we know there is a main function uh, in this program. And so we can type break main, and this is set a breakpoint at main. Now, if we run with an argument, we see that it says we're at breakpoint one, it provides the memory address, and then it says we are in main. And so we'll notice that the program hasn't said uh, hello Robert yet which is what we would expect if it was running all the way to completion. Uh, instead, we are at the very beginning of main. Now, how do I, how do I know this? Uh, GDB doesn't by default uh, print out a lot of information to provide us context. It's actually a pretty bare bones um, debugger here as far as the initial information that it's going to provide you. So I can take a look at my registers by typing info reg, which is short for register. Now this shows us the CPU registers that we are familiar with, uh, like RAX, RBX, RCX, uh, etc. Uh, we should also see the stack pointer, which is located right here, which is RSP. And we should have uh, RIP, the instruction pointer, which is shown right here. Now, RIP always points to the next instruction to be executed. So this is great. I can see kind of the CPU state, what is in the registers, but what if I want to look at the assembly instructions that are running? Well, the first thing that I might want to do is print out one of these register values directly. Typing info register every time tells me what the value of every register is. But what if I just want to see one register? Well, I can just print a single register uh, with the print command uh, followed by the register that I'm trying to access. Now you'll notice that I started RAX in this case with a dollar sign. Uh, variables are referenced using the dollar sign in GDB. Now, instead of typing print, I can sh use a shorthand of just P. So if I type P dollar sign RAX, it's going to print the exact same thing as if I typed print dollar sign RAX. 
Now I can do the same thing with RIP, which is the instruction pointer. So this tells me that RIP is pointing at uh, some memory address here ending in 5189. Now, in addition to print, there is another command called examine. The shorthand for examine is X. Now, examine is nice because it allows you to specify the format that you want to display information in. Now, examine will, will dereference the value that you give it. So when I said print RIP up here, we see that the value ends in 5189. And this matches the info registers value right here, ending in 5189. Now, if instead I say examine and I give it I, which is short for instruction at RIP, this uh, the kind of translation of this shorthand is examine an instruction at RIP. Every time we examine, we're examining at somewhere. So the location, the value that we're providing here, in this case RIP, is a location that we are examining. Now what we see is this 5189 memory location is shown on the left, and then we see an assembly instruction. Now, on its own, this doesn't provide us with a lot of information. Fortunately, in this format value here, I can list a number. So I can say examine 10 instructions at RIP. And so now I get to start to see what is going on in this program. And there, there isn't a limit for how many I can print. So this is 20 instructions at RIP. And so now this is starting to look like the code of main. Uh, if we look at the right hand side where we have the C code, and then we look at the assembly code on the left, we see that there is a comparison for some value with one. And then if it is greater than one, then it's going to jump to main plus 51 which is this line right here. Now, if it is not greater than one, then it's going to continue to the next assembly instruction, which is going to load some value into RDI, call puts, put one into EDI, and then call exit. Looking at the assembly code on the right hand side, the, these instructions here correspond with this check right here. So the C code we wrote if argc is less than two, but the assembly that was actually compiled down said jump if it's greater than one. And, and these, these two uh, representations are functionally equivalent, right? And so now we, we can get some insight into what is going on in the code of this target. Now, it's great that we can examine at RIP, but what if I want to see all of main and I don't know how big main is? Well, there is an instruction uh, called disassemble. And so we can disassemble main. Now this is all of the assembly instructions that are in main. Similarly, I know that we have this my hello function, right? And we haven't gone into that. So we're not in main or we're not in my hello function. Uh, we are in main and we have this little arrow here when we disassembled and it shows us the instruction where RIP is. So RIP is at the first instruction of main. But what if, even though I'm in main, I want to just take a look at what is the disassembly of my hello function? Well, we can use the shorthand for disassemble and say disassemble my hello function. And so now we see the assembly instructions for my hello function.
Now, I said that examine has this uh, format value. So we can examine, for instance, the 10 instructions at RIP, right? Well, there's a, there's a number of different um, shorthands for this format that you can use in addition to I for instruction. So let's first look at the registers and let's start looking at memory uh, that is uh, on the stack. Uh, so something that could be a variable or a value, right? Uh, now, if we want to look at the stack, we want to look at things relative to RSP. So if we can print the stack pointer with P RSP. Now, if I want to look at the memory that's on the stack, uh, what I commonly use is I would say examine, let's say four GX, which is shorthand for giant hex. Well, and then I can say RSP, and this will print out four giant hex values at the stack pointer. Similarly, what if I want to instead interpret these as signed numbers? Then I would use D. And now I have four signed numbers. I can also use U for unsigned. Now, in this case, uh, we notice that the highest bit of all of these values is not set. So the signed and unsigned values are equivalent. Uh, this will not always be the case. Uh, another uh, method or format that you can use is A, which is short for address. And that's going to interpret or print four addresses uh, beginning at RSP. Now, we look here. We see that now, since we have specified that we want to view these values as addresses, uh, GDB is going a little bit further uh, and telling us if it is an address and it knows what it, where this is, it's going to provide some context to us. And so these format strings uh, can definitely be helpful uh, in helping us define what it is that we want to look at. Now, initially we use this print command and print does allow you, uh, for instance, we print RSP. We can print RSP as a number or we can print RSP as an address, right? Uh, however, uh, one of the things that is a bit difficult to do uh, is what if I want to print, not examine. So if I examine, uh, we'll say one giant hex at RSP. And so I have this value here ending in 7083. What if instead I want to print that value instead of examine the memory location? Well, print uses a format that is similar to C style casting. And so we're going to need to say that we want to dereference and then cast as a long, long pointer RSP. So we have RSP, which we are casting to a pointer to a long, and then we are dereferencing that. And let's print it um, as an address. So now I get that value. Now, one of the things that is nice about print is, and you'll see this with a number of the commands that I've ran, uh, we get this dollar sign number equals something. So GDB will store anything that you print as a variable that you can reference later. So right now, for instance, we have this dollar sign five from a print command we ran several commands ago. If I type print F and we'll say, give me a long hex of dollar sign five, there is that value. And we can make it prettier by inserting a new line. Uh, there is that value that I referenced a while ago. And so this is extremely convenient. 
but we'll touch on um, storing variables and utilizing these a little bit later. I just want to mention that as one of the reasons that you'd want to use print uh, instead of examine. So let's go back and see where we are in this program. We are still at the beginning of main. We are at main plus zero here. And if we print RIP uh, as an address, uh, we'll see that we are at this right here, this uh, 5189 at the beginning of May. Now, what if I want to move forward? Well, then I would use either SI for step instruction or NI for next instruction. And we'll cover the difference here uh, a little bit later as we move forward in this program. So I'm going to use SI. Now it says that we have advanced. And if we disassemble main, we'll see that we're now at main plus four. And I can again print as an address RIP. And this, this confirms that. Now, what if I SI, SI, SI. Well, now I want to know where am I, right? And by default, GDB doesn't print out any of this information. Well, GDB has a command called display, which allows you to specify information that you would like to show up every time that GDB breaks or steps. And so we could, for instance, say display as an address, uses one of these format um, values as well, uh, RIP. And so now, as I step, I can see what RIP is. Well, what if I want to see the instructions? Well, we could say display, and let's go four instructions. And then we're going, because we're using display, we're going to have to um, cast this and you use that kind of print format. So we'll say uh, long star. RIP, what did I do here? Uh, oh, I apologize, we don't need to cast that. And so now, every time we step, now we can see where we are as we're moving forward in this program. So now we're at main plus 23, main plus 27, main plus 29. Oh, we jumped. So we are at this jump instruction and we jumped to main plus 51. So let's keep going. And now we see here that we are at a call. This is where the difference between SI and NI will matter. Now, NI, which was short for next instruction, will stay at the current level, the current frame. So right now we're at main 63. If I were to type NI, I would go to main plus 68. I would go to the next instruction. Now, if I typed SI, then I will step instruction. Step instruction uh, will go down into this call of my hello function. So let's do that. And now we see I'm at the beginning of my hello function. And so that is the difference between stepping and, or step instruction and next instruction. Now I'm in this my hello function and I could type ni, ni, ni until I get to the return from my hello function back up to main. But I can use a, another command called finish now, finish will run the rest of the current function that I'm in until it returns. So when I run finish, it's going to run my hello function, and it's going to break on the other side of the call my hello function up in main. And so if I type finish, I am now just on the other side of this call function, of this call instruction. Now, we can print that out, if we recall. We can examine, let's say, eight instructions at RIP minus, let's say, 
hex 10. And what we see, these are the previous instructions of main. Here was the call that we stepped into when we used step instruction. And now we are on this move instruction, which immediately follows the call. So when I ran finish up above, it ran my hello function. My hello function said, hello, Robert. And then it returned control back to the debugger once my hello function uh, was over. Now, so far, we've just done step instruction and move instruction, and this has been yeah, yeah, great, but typing next instruction, next instruction, next instruction is probably not what we want to do every time. So let's run this again. And we're at the beginning of main. Why are we at the beginning of main? Because a while ago, we set a breakpoint. And so if I type info break, this lists the breakpoint and shows us, hey, we, we have a breakpoint set at main. But what if I want to break at my hello function? Well, we could break and say my hello function. And so now we have a second breakpoint, which we can see right here that our first breakpoint is at this memory location, which is main. And we have a second breakpoint at my hello function. Now, let's get rid of the breakpoint at main. I can do this by saying delete break one. And if we look at info break, there is now one breakpoint with, with ID number two, and it is at my hello function. So let's run this program uh, with uh, one argument wrong. Yes, we want to start from the beginning. We are now, we ran through main and we are now at the beginning of my hello function. Now, you'll notice that when we look at a function like this, uh, there are memory locations and there are also offsets. You can set a breakpoint to a memory location. So you could, for instance, copy this exact value and say break at this location. And then if we type C, which is short for continue, we run until we hit that location. Now, setting breakpoints to hard-coded memory locations is not a very good practice, in my opinion. Uh, what you'll find in a lot of real real-world programs and some of the later challenges uh, that we have here in some of the later modules is these, these addresses will change across executions. And so a hard-coded value will not be true um, if you try and run the program more than once. So instead, let's delete the breakpoint at three. And this was at 5207. Let's see here, 5207. Was my hello function. 5207 plus 51. And so we can specify this location symbolically, relatively and symbolically, by saying break my hello function plus 51. And you'll see that this breakpoint is at the exact same location, but we defined it relative to where the function begins. This approach will be much, um, much more effective uh, as you debug more complicated programs. And so I would encourage you to reference uh, functions by their offset if you're going for a specific location. Okay, so the next thing that we may want to do is revisit some of these um, variables that I mentioned earlier. So 
let's go ahead and look at our breakpoints. Let's clean some of these up. Let's delete breakpoint two and let's delete breakpoint four. Let's break at main. Let's run it. Okay. So I said that you can store values um, as variables that you can use. Because if we run, for instance, info reg, we see these and we can reference these by printing, for instance, RSI or printing RDI. And we said that every time that we print something, it is stored uh, in the history as a variable here. So we can print, for instance, 11, and that's going to show the same value that we had at the time that we ran this um, ran this command. It's the value that saved, not the command, just for the record. Now I can also set uh, user-defined variables in GDB, and I do that using the set command. So I would type set, and then I will name my variable, call it my var, and we'll set this equal to I, we could do another variable like RDI and then we could print my var and we see that my var equals RDI and RDI is two, All right? And so that, that, that's helpful because I may want to reference a particular value or store it, right? Now I can also store a Aside from a, a register value, I can also store a memory value, right? And to do that, we're going to do something very similar to the print command that we had before. So we would need to say set my var equal to, uh, let's just take the value that is at RSP, right? We're going to dereference as a long RSP. And so now, if we examine one giant hacks at RSP, we see that this is the value ending in 7083. And if we print my var, well, that's a number, but it's not formatted how we would want. So let's print it in hex my var. We see that it is the same value. And so we can store memory locations or registers in user-defined variables. Now, one of the things that I've been using, but I didn't call attention to it, is that when I reference these registers, I'm also using this dollar sign symbol. And that means that RDI is in fact a variable. And so let's look at the registers here. And we see, for instance, RAX is this value here that ends in 5189. What happens if I type set RAX equals, say, zero? Well, let's print RAX. It's zero. And we've now set that register value to be zero. And so not only can we store these values in variables that we're using within the debugger, but we can actually set register values directly in the debugger. Similarly, uh, we can set memory um, values in the debugger. So uh, let's see if we can do that. So let's do, we'll reference RSP again. Give me a giant hacks at RSP. And then let's set, and this is where we have to again use that C style casting notation. A long star at RSP equal to OX1337, okay? And then let's take a look at uh, what is at RSP now. So we're examining the giant hex at RSP. And we now see that that same value has been set to 1337 in hex. And so GDB is extremely powerful because not only can we view values that are in the running program, but we can manually set these values to be whatever we'd like and then continue execution. 
In fact, if I disassemble main here, we know that RIP is a register, right? And so right now, RIP points to the beginning of main. We haven't even ran main. What happens if I say we set RIP equal to main plus 73? All right, and it's where are we in main? We have just moved RIP. Now we haven't changed uh, any of the rest of the register state. We didn't actually execute anything. We just set RIP to suddenly be this value that is at main plus 73. Now, the jumping RIP like this can certainly cause uh, unintended behavior and break the program because the internal state, both in memory and in registers, is not going to reflect any of the instructions that were expected between where we were and where we are, right? Um, but I can, in this particular case, step forward and seg fault, which is because that internal state uh, does not reflect what is expected from moving forward here. But it's an example of how you can set a register and make extreme changes to how the program behaves because it is in GDB. So the last thing uh, that I'm going to uh, mention as far as using GDB directly here is scripting. So GDB does have the ability to run a script. So on the right hand side here, we're going to open a file and we're going to call it myscript.gdb. Now, if we check the man page for GDB, we'll see that there is a dash x option and it says execute GDB commands from file file. And so we're going to use gdb dash x my script dot gdb followed by the program that we are going to debug. Now gdb scripts work by running the exact same commands that we were using live um, in the interactive debugger just a few moments ago. So if I were to fire up GDB, what would I want to do? Well, one of the things that I might want to do is set a breakpoint. So let's set a breakpoint at main. And then let's run it with the argument, with an argument of Robert. And then, yeah, let's just do that. Let's see what happens here. And now we see we are at main because we ran the probe. We set a breakpoint and we see the result of that right here. Breakpoint set breakpoint one at OX1189. And then we type run Robert, which starts the program. And it has broke at the breakpoint that we set here at main. So let's quit out of here. Now I could also type, for instance, continue. Now this should set a breakpoint, run it, uh, and then continue once it hits that breakpoint. And now we see that we hit the breakpoint, it continued execution, the program printed out hello Robert, and then it exited. Well, what if I want to run, and then let's print RIP, and then we continue, so we can do this. And so now we're, we're beginning to automate this process of what do I want to do so I don't have to type this every single time, right? Now, a common activity that you may want to do is at a breakpoint, perform a certain action. And so GDB, you know, right now this happens to work because this is all occurring in sequence. Right, But what if at every time that I run into this breakpoint, I want to run a series of commands? Well, GDB allows you to do that. In the script, you set a breakpoint, then you use the commands instruction. The commands instruction 
uh, will apply everything in between commands and end. These commands here will execute every time this breakpoint is hit. Now, on the left-hand side here, we saw that GDB would tell us we've hit this breakpoint. And that's helpful uh, sometimes, but sometimes I want GDB to, to not give me that noise. I just want to see this value. Just show me, show me RIP. Print RIP, and then when you're done printing RIP, continue. And let's print RIP uh, as an address. Okay. And so now we're going to start GDB. We're going to set a breakpoint at main. Every time that we hit this breakpoint at main, it is going to be quiet. It's going to print the instruction pointer, and then it's going to continue onward. And so this is like a conditional hook. The section right here is every time we hit this breakpoint, execute these commands. Then we will start uh, the program with the argument Robert, uh, and then we will quit at the next opportunity. Let's see if this works. Okay. Mm, well, it still told us well, it told us that the breakpoint was set, but it didn't tell us uh, breakpoint one at in main. All right? It didn't say uh, breakpoint one at this memory location in main when we hit it. And that's what silent does over here. And so now uh, we can begin automating GDB using this um, script value. Now, this is particularly useful in cases where it is difficult to reach a certain point in the program. There may be a number of uh, commands or values that need to get set in order to navigate GDB to the specific place that I want to be, right? So if, for example, instead of main, we wanted to break at my hello function, and then I know I want to, we can print uh, RIP, we're no longer going to continue because I want I want to inspect what's going on once we get to my hello function. We can run this script, and now I am in my hello function, which we see right here. We are at the beginning of my hello function. So the deeper in and more the more complex the target is that you're debugging, the more useful using a GDB script to get to the specific lo location in the program you want uh, will be. Now, you'll notice that my GDB is printing out in Intel syntax. Uh, if you have not uh, been made any modifications to your GDB, your GDB is probably in AT&T syntax. The reason for that is the default for GDB is AT&T syntax. Now, there is a file that you can make in your home directory called GDB init. And this is a series of, of commands that will run every time GDB starts. And you'll, you'll notice mine begins with set disassembly flavor Intel. This is what is making the GDB display an Intel flavor. If I comment that out and I run GDB on a.out, let's break at main, let's run it and disassemble main. Uh, we see now I'm in AT&T syntax. However, when I have this, Uh, set this assembly flavor Intel set. We see that it is an Intel syntax. So if you uh, want to set that, what you can do is you can run the following command. Echo set disassembly flavor Intel. 
and then we're going to write that to GDB init. Now, I'm not going to run this because my GDB init already has this value. And you'll, you'll notice that there is a second line that I have commented out, and it says source opt GEF GEF.py. So GDB does have a number of plugins. Uh, GEF is a popular one. Now, so far through this entire uh, video, uh, GDB has not been very forthcoming with information and that tells me where I am in the program or what is going on. Uh, GEF is a plugin that solves a lot of that uh, issue. Uh, however, it is very noisy and there's a lot going on on your screen uh, when you have GEF enabled. So I've enabled GEF because my GDB init has this source slash opt slash GEF slash GEF dot pi line. So now if I run GDB a dot out and we'll do the same thing, we'll set a breakpoint at main and we will run the target with an argument. So I have to actually shrink the font size because there is a lot going on here. So GEF uh, adds color coding to all of the values. And we have a legend up here at the top uh, that shows us what these, these values um, or these color codes mean. We then have a register section up here at the top. Uh, and this shows us, here's RAX, here's the value at RAX. Now, GEF will additionally show these little arrows and, and try and provide some context for what, it, what does this value likely mean? Like, well, you know, how is this value being used? Because remember, when you're debugging in GDB or you're writing a C program or looking at assembly, it's just bytes, right? Uh, you don't have, for instance, an int in a register. Everything is just bytes, and it's a matter of how you decide to interpret it. Now, GEF tries to apply some smart context here to kind of paint some meaning over the register values. So we see, for instance, RAX right now is pointing to main plus zero, which is the instruction that begin the instruction end BR64. And so RAX happens to point to the beginning of main. If we look at RDX, it is a purple value, which the color coding legend here says that is a stack pointer. And so RDX uh, has this stack value, which stack values in GDB tend to begin with a seven and then a bunch of Fs. So we have this stack pointer that points to this value. And this value here that RDX points to also looks like a pointer. And this pointer points to a string uh, that uh, is a bunch of bytes that are ASCII characters. And those ASCII characters, the C string, uh, has the value shell equals bin slash bash. And so the, this is definitely a lot more information going on. Uh, and it can help us quickly kind of figure out where we are in the program, right? What is the program state? Uh, similarly, uh, if you've spent some time with assembly, uh, you're aware that compare instructions uh, like jump greater, jump less than, uh, you perform a comparison and then there's some type of conditional jump, right? That's how, that's how we do uh, branching at the assembly level. Uh, they, these branches are determined based upon the flag values. So in addition to the registers, GEF has this flag line right here where we can see that right now for instance the zero flag is set the parity flag is set and we can see that because the text is kind of in in bold right the next section shows us uh, a little bit this is not the entire stack but a little bit of the stack so rsp currently points to this memory location and this memory location holds this value and this shows us the first, what's that, hex 38 um, bytes of, our, of the stack, uh, which can be useful because generally speaking, uh, the things that are occurring in the current function frame are near the top of the stack. This next section here is the assembly instructions. So I don't have to type 
disassemble main or display 10 instructions at RIP, right? Uh, GEF is just going to provide us with this is the instruction you're on and this is the next several instructions that are going to occur. It also tells us where we are, why we're there. So in this case, it's because we hit a breakpoint and then it provides the standard GDB prompt. Now, this is great and it's a lot of information and it is extremely helpful. Uh, I use GEF and a number of other people um, that I know that spend time with GDB also use GEF. But just keep in mind that it's a lot of information uh, that is getting thrown at you. Now, this video is specifically being made in reference to these Embryo GDB challenges. Now, remember the challenges are located in the challenge folder. So if I run this first challenge, it is going to start up GDB. And we see that in this message right here. It says the program is restarting under the control of GDB. You can run the program with GDB command run. So let's type run. Now, because I have GEF, where did the program's output go, right? The program, we're, we're just at a breakpoint here. I'm not sure what happened. Well, the, the answer is because GEF is extremely verbose and it prints out all of this information every time that we stop or pause somewhere, we have actually scrolled past the output of the program. And so we have to scroll up to see that here is the program's output, right? And so th this can be frustrating working with some of these uh, modules and so, or the, any of the Embryo GDB modules. And so I have two um, kind of approaches that can make this way less frustrating um, to deal with. So the first one, which honestly is probably the, the better way to go from a learning perspective, is just disable GEF for these challenges. Now I run the challenge. I do not get all of the noise from GEF. I type run and the program's output is visible and we get an idea of what it is it wants us to do with the prompt right here for us to follow the instructions uh, from the challenge. Okay. And so in this case, it says type continue. And there, there you go. We, we have a flag. Uh, level one is, is pretty straightforward. It just wants to get you um, comfortable with the idea of the program output is here and you are at a GDB prompt. Now, the second way uh, that you can kind of get around this GEF noise GDB output is we can enable Jeff, right? And then we're going to take advantage of uh, something that we saw in the baby squid? No, the program interaction uh, modules. Uh, where we used pipes and FIFOs and some of these these more um, advanced ways of kind of redirecting input and output. So I can make a FIFO and we'll just call it A. And so now I have this FIFO here in temp embryo GDB. So I'm going to run the challenge. Now, instead of just typing run, I'm going to type run and redirect the output to temp embryo GDB A. Now, it says we're running the challenge, but there's no output. Now, if you remember from the program interaction modules, with a FIFO, somebody needs to be writing on one end and another process needs to be reading on the other. And so right now the program is writing to A, but we don't have anything reading from A. And so if in another terminal window, we type cat A, what we end up with is we have GDB with all of the GEF output on one side, and then we have the program's output on the right-hand side. And so th this is a way of having both of, kind of the best of both worlds, but one of the things to keep in mind is with this setup, we have to always type run with the redirection, right? 
and I've redirected it, but now I have to cat a again. And so we have to do this on both sides every time that we want to run. And so this is both convenient and inconvenient, depending upon which way um, you'd like to kind of see it. Now, in the event of the program, this program does not ask for input. But if the program asked for input on the right-hand side, I would actually need to enter it on the left-hand side. So at some point, if a program calls, for instance, read, and it reads from standard in, and we continue to that point in GDB, the GDB prompt will be gone and anything that we type will be standard in being passed to the program. Now this can be a little confusing because the prompt to provide input will be over here on the right hand side. But remember from standard, um, standard IO redirection, when we do run and, and we do this uh, greater than symbol, we are only redirecting standard out. So we are sending standard out to A, which is going to be what is on the right hand side here. But standard in is still standard in of the terminal window that is running GDB. So keep that in mind because that's an easy kind of gotcha uh, if you try and use this, um, this method for keeping GEF up while running the GDB challenges. Uh, I do believe that the um, better approach is to just edit your GDB init file. And just for these challenges, don't use GEF. Uh, it'll force you to practice using some of the commands like print, display, uh, examine. And so you'll, you'll get more practice working with these um, commands, uh, which you will use even with GEF, because there's a number of um, cases, actually the vast majority of the time, where what you want to look at is not something that GEF displays by default. Like I may want to look at a memory address that isn't, that is on the stack, but isn't in this little window of what GEF decided to display, right? Or I may want to uh, look at the instructions that are not where I'm currently at. And so these um, functions, these GDB functions that I mentioned earlier, before we had GEF, are still valuable and you'll still use them on a regular basis when using GDB. Uh, as always, if you do have any problems or run into issues working on these challenges, uh, please reach out to us on the Discord. We try and hang out there and answer questions. And with that, good luck.